Well, okay, let's, let's begin. My name is Austin Roos. Um, I uh, am the president of CFAM, the Center for Family and Human Rights, and uh, I've been doing this work since August of 1997. Can you imagine? Yeah. You know, I was in magazine publishing for many, many years. Uh, I worked in New York, Fortune Forbes, The Atlantic Monthly, Rolling Stone, and uh, just got a call to, uh, to do this kind of work. You know, to, to combine my, my two loves, religion and politics, you know, that you can never talk about, uh, which I like to talk about all the time. Uh, and, and, and so I just happened to meet a young lady one time in the summer of 1997 who was in New York, uh, and they had raised a bunch of money uh, to open up, a, she said, a pro-life lobbying group at the UN. And, and I said, and I, and I, I swear I heard bells ringing, you know, it was exactly what I was looking for and we started CFAM that year in a windowless office right across the street from the UN and we've been doing it ever since. And as I said downstairs, um, we, are, we are a creature of the call that went out for people of faith to go to Cairo uh, in 1994. Uh, to get involved in a UN conference, uh, the International Conference on Population and Development, um, because it was it was known in many circles that the UN was well along the way to making abortion internationally recognized human right, and so the founders of CFAM, I was not one of them, uh, went to Cairo and then they went to Beijing, uh, along with lots of people. Did you go to either one of those? Uh, I got other people to go to Cairo. Yeah. Why didn't you go? Uh, why didn't I go? Yeah. Um, I felt like it was supposed to be Keith Tusi to go, and it turned out he was the right person to go. Who, who was that? <laughs> he was one of the Operation Rescue leaders. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. Anyway, it was a phenomenal experience. Uh, I mean, people had a life-changing experience there. And, and they were people literally just like, just like you and me. They were school teachers, they were students, they were lawyers, they were doctors, who just got it in their head that they needed to go to Cairo in 1994 to lobby UN delegates on the life issues. I mean, how absurd wow. is that? Wow. You know, and, and even now, I would be a little bit cowed about flying to Cairo, you know? And I fly internationally all the time, but to go to Cairo and then to Beijing. And that's how our movement started. And what the other side tried to do and failed, and failed at that time, was they wanted an explicit right to abortion. You know, they, they, they want, here's the idea, that no matter what happens domestically with our laws, they want to be able to impose a right to abortion on all the countries in the world, no matter what the people say. So for instance, it is an absolute dead certainty that when Roe v. Wade is eventually in, uh at the Supreme Court, uh, documents of the United Nations will absolutely be cited. It's a guarantee. They'll either be cited by uh, the uh, majority uh, upholding Roe or by the minority uh, in dissent when, when Roe is overturned. Uh, because they absolutely believe that this is how they're going to guarantee a right to abortion. And it is also how they believe that they will impose abortion on the rest of the world. Now, most of the world allows for some form of abortion. Uh, there's only six countries, I think. Uh, that, that make abortion illegal, and it may be fewer than that at this point. Um, so it, it's, it's almost a moot point at this point, except that they really do want to have an international right to abortion. Now, because they failed um, to, to get an, an overt right to abortion, um, what they uh, have resorted to do, doing is, is to use code words, uh, primarily the phrase reproductive health also the phrase reproductive rights. Uh, as Wendy knows, these phrases appear hundreds of times in hundreds of UN documents. And the idea is that the more that these terms are repeated, uh, it's, it establishes uh, what's known as customary international law. So that even if there's not an explicit right to abortion in, in a hard law treaty, that governments will recognize that they have a legal obligation to keep abortion legal. Um, that's customary international law. So, so what the pro-life uh, and pro-family movement has done at the United Nations since that time is, is first of all, to make sure that, that abortion is, is, doesn't come back into, into UN language. Um, it appears in the, in the original Cairo document, but with, but with caveats that make it clear that, it, that, that abortion laws have to be a part, uh, uh, have to be considered in national laws, it, it, you know, that, that countries get to decide it on their own. 
um, and also that, uh, uh, that it can't be used as a method of family planning. But, so there are very important caveats that were established at the Cairo conference in 1994. And they're caveats that to this day annoy the, the left, the sexual left. Uh, they, they hate the caveats and they try to fight against the caveats being put in. But I'll tell you what, to this day, we still are fighting. I mean, we just finished the General Assembly in December, and we fought tooth and nail for three months over the question of reproductive health. For three months. Um, over time, the debate has changed a little bit. Um, reproductive health was just mentioned so many times in UN documents that people got used to it. And we just had a kind of an all-staff meeting yesterday, and, and Susan, our friend Susan, my colleague Susan Yoshihara, um, was ticking off our the successes that my organization had over the last uh, year, and number chief among them is making reproductive health controversial again. The thing about getting red hats and saying we're going to make reproductive health controversial again, and and you know those guys did. You know Susan and and, and, and Stefano and Lisa really did, and the the Trump administration to this day has an official policy that's a little tricky in, in terms of it, 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 getting it done. But they, they have a, a policy for their UN negotiators that whenever reproductive health uh, uh, appears in a document, they have to try to get it deleted. Failing, having, uh, failing that, they have to uh, uh, substitute a better word. Um, and failing that, they have to qualify it using Cairo language. Uh, this, is, this, was, this has been our position for many, many years, and it is now the position of the Trump administration. Having said that, there are people in the Trump administration who don't really like this, and so it's still, it's still a big fight to get the Trump administration to do the right thing um, on that. But we have made it controversial again. Um, and one of the remarkable things about the UN pro-life movement is the fact that we don't just work with the U.S. administration. We certainly didn't work with the U.S. administration during the Obama years or the Clinton years. But, but when there is a pro-life president, it, you know, we have fairly good access. Uh, but we also work very closely with the Africans. You know, it, it's like uh, Stefano Gennarini, who's a lawyer who, who, who works for CFAM, is, you know, as um, informed about UN documents and international law with regard to reproductive health as anybody on the planet. And he's a regular advisor, I mean, a, practically a daily advisor to the African Union. Um, and it is remarkable because, man, a lot of these, these, these people come to the UN and they don't know anything, you know? And, and they come from desperately poor countries. Um, and and they're, they're on the butt end of uh, what uh, Pope Francis called ideological colonialism, where you know Western intellectuals are trying to impose a particular view of the human person and human sexuality on the whole world. And they come to the United Nations and they don't really know anything. Uh, they come from, they have teeny tiny staffs. I mean, CFAM, we have, there are five of us full time. We're bigger than some of the you know delegations from foreign countries at the United Nations, and so we perform and other NGOs perform a vital s staff function. But it is a remarkable experience to work with these people over years. We work very closely with the Muslim countries, you know, um, even the Muslim countries that are enemies of the United States. Uh, I remember one of my favorite stories from, from my experience of working on the floor at the UN, this is years and years ago, I think it was at Cairo plus five or Beijing plus five. They keep doing these things every five years, <laughs> coming back for another bite of the apple. Um, and uh, it, it was a meeting that was starting at 10 o'clock at night. And, and that's one of the things that happens at these meetings, is that toward the end of a negotiating session, which are generally a week or two weeks, they'll go all night long. And they'll send the translators home. So these people have to negotiate complicated things in a language that is not native to them. Um, there's a lot of unfair things that they do to these people. Anyway, it was like 10 o'clock at night, and it was, it was probably going to go all night long. Um, and, I, and I went out on the floor, and I went up to the Sudanese ambassador. You know, the Sudanese, not very good to Christians, but this guy was a, um, a lion when it came to the life issues. And he was offended at how hard the European Union was pushing, and the, the UN agencies were pushing uh, to establish uh, uh, abortion as a right. And I went out on the floor that night, and I said, you know, um, it's going to get rugged tonight. You know, the, the European Union is really going to gang up on you, and, and I just want you to know that uh, when it gets toughest, 
you should just look right up there off the floor because there's going to be 20 Christians praying for you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that guy was remarkable that night. You know, he was like pounding his desk. And, and anyway, it, it is, it is, a friend of mine, one of the first guys I ever met at the United Nations, uh, a Filipino diplomat, um, told me that, uh, he asked me when we first showed up, he said, would you be willing to meet with the Iranians? And I went, I don't know. Can I meet with the Iranians? I mean, I'm an American. And he said, well, you know, um, policy and politics of the United Nations are a little bit like a Rubik's Cube. You know, and, and you know, yeah, you're going to have to meet with the Iranians. And funny, the Iranians have been quite good for the life issues and the family issues over the years. Uh, I mean, it's a weird situation because we're up against people that ought to be our allies. You know what I mean? The Western democracies. <laughs> and they're all our enemies. You know, it's like the European Union, France and Germany and the UK. They're all our enemies on these issues. And our friends are, you know, the Africans and also the, the thug states. You know, um, <clears throat> it's a topsy-turvy world that we, that we, that we work on at, at the UN. And this is what we do. Um, you know, the UN will, will come out with a document. And, in a couple of weeks, they're going to come out with a document on something called the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, happens every year. We're now entering what I call the Commission season. The Commission on the Status. It's so tedious. The Commission on the Status of Women. The Commission on Population Development. The Commission on Social Development. So on and so forth. And they're all negotiating sessions, and they and they negotiate a document that is then fed into the General Assembly in the fall. And all of these documents are meant to make political statements. And and make governments think that they have certain obligations um, in international law, which they don't have, but these documents imply that. It's a big fib. It's just a big fib. And, and so what will happen is, is they'll, you know, the, the, a committee of the left will draft a document and they'll present it to the negotiating body of the United Nations, which, which it, it you know could be you know 50 countries it, you know the, generally they're a subset of the general assembly so 50 60 countries and then they will begin with the amendments and a document that's this big will get to be this big and then they'll go through the document line by line paragraph by paragraph and negotiate it um, and uh, keep some things in and take some things out um, and uh, they they work by what they say is consensus. And, and that um, in the very early days of our work, uh, consensus meant that if three countries disagreed with something, it was taken out. So at the Rio Conference on the Environment, they really worked on consensus, and it was a huge victory for us, because we're always able to get three countries to, to disagree with a piece of language. But over the years, they've changed this, and now it's 20 countries, 30 countries, 40 countries, 50 countries that you need. And that's our job, is, is to gather enough countries together to object to a piece of language that it's taken out. Um, and even then, um, the, uh, the left who controls the meeting uh, will end up ignoring the wishes of these countries. Some years ago, we negotiated a document called the um, International Covenant on uh, Persons with Disabilities. Um, and that was the first time that the phrase reproductive health ever appeared in a hard law treaty. And when that was negotiated, and this is a problem, because it's never appeared in a hard law treaty before. It's always appeared in non-binding resolutions. Uh, but a hard law treaty is a different thing. And so the night that it was accepted, there were 23 countries that were objecting to its, its, its inclusion. 23 countries would have, should have been sufficient to keep it out. But the chair basically ignored them and told them to write reservations and, 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 and things like that. So, so it is a remarkably unfair process in the United Nations, and they don't even abide by their own uh, by their own rules. Um, so, so anyway, the, so there are non-binding resolutions that we work on all the time. There are hard law treaties, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on Persons with Disabilities, the Convention on uh, oh the CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, you know, there, there are these human rights treaties that, that I would bet that you guys have never heard of. Have you guys ever heard of the CEDAW Treaty? Have you ever heard of the Convention on the Rights of the Child? Yes. It's so weird that, that they write these treaties and they expect governments and peoples to, f to, to adhere to them. Most people have never heard of them. Most people have never heard of them. 
Um, and, the, and then these hard law treaties are then turned over to what are known as treaty bodies. And the treaty bodies are bodies of experts that uh, have the authority to review how governments are adhering to the treaty. But these, committee, these committees, these committees of experts, have taken it upon themselves to rewrite these hard law treaties. Some of the great work that Wendy did over the years was on CEDAW and tracking the craziness of the CEDAW, the CEDAW committee. So, I mean, the CEDAW committee, you know, told China that they had to legalize lesbianism, and they criticized Belarus for establishing Mother's Day because Mother's Day is a negative cultural stereotype, and you know, stuff like that, <laughs> silly stuff, but also important stuff. The Human Rights Committee recently uh, interpreted the right to life as the right to abortion. A woman does not have the right to life unless she has the right to kill her unborn child. And so this is an expert committee of the United Nations. The Committee on the Rights of the Child told the Catholic Church they had to change their, the church's teaching on contraception, abortion, and homosexuality. This is what's going on at the United Nations. It's one of the great unknown fights in the entire world. Um, but I'll tell you what, the people that do it are really quite remarkable. You know. Uh, some years ago, we, there, there was a, I don't remember which one it was, but it was one of the plus fives, and uh, we, uh, we, took, we got there really early, but, you know, when the UN was opening up, and uh, we, took, we took this group of people, including the Catholic priest, uh, into the balcony of, of, of the big conference room, you know, with the 100 foot windows overlooking the East River, and, you know, just really dramatic. And, and he read the prayers of exorcism, and uh, the prayers, uh, blessing of building of communication. And uh, there were, you know, Catholics and Evangelicals and Mormons there. I mean, it was really, it was really remarkable. You know, he had, he took out his, you know, his kit and he had holy oils and things like that. And it was really amazing. And like, as he was doing that, the sun sort of cracked up over Queens and came into the build, in, into the room like it was, you know, God the Father telling us this is exactly what I want you people to be doing. And then the, 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 the door started like rattling, like there were demons trying to get out but it was people just coming in for the meeting. <laughs> there are people, there are ladies who come to these conferences just to pray. You know, our friend Peter Smith calls them the praying ladies. They just sit back and, and they pray for the confusion of our enemies and, you know, that, that, our, that our people will be, will be brave. You know, the, uh, the, the, the pressure on the, on the diplomats is, is intense, you know. Uh, I mean, they're going up against the powers of the world. They're going up against UNICEF. Is bad. They're going against the UN Population Fund, billion dollar agency. They're going up the World Health Organization. They're going against the UN Secretariat with 70,000 employees. They're going against the European Union. They're going against the governments of the European Union. You know, they're going against the Ford Foundation and the Gates Foundation and the Hewlett Packard Foundation. And, and, and you know, it, it's just simple <coughs> diplomats and simple pro lifers who are going against the powers of, of the world. And it's remarkable because we have beaten them. <laughs> you know, there's no global right to abortion. There's no global right to same-sex marriage. There's no, there's, no, there's no redefinition of the family. Good golly, we've even got a good definition of gender. The definition of gender at the United Nations, uh, this is in the International Criminal Court document, the, the definition of gender is men and women in the context of society. Hello. And in the, in, in Beijing, in, in the Beijing, um, it was in, in the Beijing document, uh, gender is to be understood as it has traditionally been understood. You know, I mean, if we really believed in the UN, we would quote this all the time. But, you know, but we don't want to give the UN that kind of authority. But, I mean, even the UN has a good definition of gender. Uh, so it, it, it's like the pro-life and pro-family forces at the United Nations have done a truly remarkable work over the years. And it's not just my organization, it's CWA. You know CWA is getting back involved? Oh good. You know, the Shea Garrison is, is involved and and um, and you know What's family the acronym for CWA? Concern Women for America, which which Wendy was the president of for some years. Um, and uh, Family Research Council is getting back involved a little bit. Um, you know, and, and then groups you've never heard of are involved, you know, from all over the world. And people still have to raise their own money and, and come to New York and, you know, and, and stay in, you know, school gymnasiums in, in Harlem and, uh, you know, come down and, and, and lobby. And it, it's, it's, it's a remarkable, life-changing experience, and it still is. Um, and, I, and I, you know, um, we live in a world that seems like everything is collapsing. You know, uh, you know, pornography is a ten billion dollar a year 
industry and there's still a million abortions and, and marriage is, is being shredded all around us and 70% uh, of black kids are raised without fathers and 50% of white kids are raised without fathers and uh, and uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm a Pollyanna but I think that the fact that he sent us here now is really a blessing. I mean, he knows, God knows what he's about. And he knows that he sent people like us. I mean, let's face it, the apostles were not the A-team, were they, Wendy? <laughs> you know, none of them went to Harvard. You know, it's like uh, the Harvard of Rome or whatever. I mean, they see just regular people. And so it is a remarkable thing that he sent Weak people, my joke is that he, he sent people like us so, so he gets all the credit, and that's fine. <laughs> and that's the way it's supposed to be, but, but golly, it's, it's quite astounding. I, I believe that we live, I, I say there's no finer time to be a faithful Christian than right now. And it's, it's a remarkable blessing, not because of all these problems, not in spite of all these problems, but because of all these problems, it's a remarkable time. And, and, I, and I say that there are halos hanging from the lowest branches of the trees. And to make, and to, all you need to do is reach up and grab one. Um, to make things, that, the problems are so vast. To make the world a better place, you have to do very little. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and that's what we found at, at the United Nations. It's, it's like, just show up. And sometimes when you just show up, man, it scares them a little bit. You know, Father Newhouse used to say, the, the, uh, you, you, you need to show up and stay to the very end and then write the history. Um, and golly, at 5 o'clock in the morning, you'll often see the only people in the room other than diplomats or pro-lifers sitting in the, in, in the gallery. Um, so that, that, that's my message to you today, is that uh, we, we should, there, nobody should despair. And nobody should think that, golly, I wish I was born in, I wish I was alive in the 50s, you know, or I wish I was alive in the Middle Ages, or, or whatever time, you know, time seems really wonderful to you. Because this is the time. This is the time to be a faithful Christian. There, there's never been a finer time. I mean, I think it's better than the second century. Um, you know, so, uh, so anyway, let me segue into this. I, I, I published this book last, last year called Fake Science, Exposing the Left Skewed Statistics, Fuzzy Facts, and Dodgy Data. Uh, Regnery asked me to do this book and, and to look at a whole host of issues. We live in a great lying age, as you know. Mm -hmm. And there are you know, white-coated experts who want to tell us how to live our lives and how they have all the answers. And you know that they don't necessarily. And you know that there are ideological things that go along with some scientific proclamations. And so I wrote this book, and it, it deals with, uh, with marriage and family and abortion and uh, even genetically modified foods and fracking. I don't know if you all are into yeah. fracking, but uh, it's a modern miracle. Um, so anyway, I'd be happy to talk about that. I'd be happy to talk about the UN. I'd ha be happy to talk about Wendy Wright. <laughs> so, please. Yes. Uh, what, what effect is the departure of Secretary Haley going to have on American activities at the UN? Well, I'm going to say something a little heretical, and that, and that is that she was not a big help to us. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. She already had her pro-life bona fides. You know, and so when she came to the UN, it was mostly for her, I think, about getting foreign policy, foreign policy credentials. And, and I think that she did not want to waste, um, um, uh, I don't want to say her time, uh, but she didn't want to spend time on the life issues when she had to deal with Korea, Iran, so on and so forth. Political capital. Political capital, that's right, that's what I was looking for. Um, uh, I'm sure she's pro-life. You know, but, but she just wasn't a big help to us. Additionally, uh, there, were, there were and are a lot of people in the administration who were against what we, what we want to do. You know, they, it was just announced a couple of days ago, a wonderful woman named Mari Stoll. Did you know Mari? She was, she was deputy to uh, the head of uh, uh, Deputy Secretary for International Organizations, Kevin Moley. And, and she came in and she drove along with Bethany Cosma. Do you know Bethany? Yeah hero, evangelical hero at USAID and they drove the pro-life policy at the United Nations and they have been set upon by jackals and, and Mari just finally had too much and, and she, as of last Friday, she quit. Um, so, um, so, so there, 
the deep state is very much against the pro-life issue at the State Department and USUN. So it was, it was, it was, it was a double-edged sword that uh, I, I, Nikki Haley was looking at other things and that we had a lot of enemies, uh, and still do. Has um, so she been replaced? Yes, uh, she, uh, Heather Nauert, uh, who was, uh, used to be on Fox and Friends and then became spokesman for um, the Secretary of State. Uh, has been nominated, and her hearing will be here in a few weeks. She has um, a little bit of a, uh, on, on, with, uh, she doesn't have a lot of quals. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, I, I think being the spokesman for the Secretary of State gives you a tremendous amount of experience, and she did that for a couple of years, so she knows a lot. Uh, but I'm told her passion is the LGBT issue and advancing the LGBT cause, and so that, 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 that's, that's what her passion will be at the UN. Um, on, on that issue, and I know this is a pro-life meeting and, and, and not everybody will necessarily uh, agree on all these issues, but, but the, the overarching issue with the LGBT cause that the United Nations is making sexual orientation and gender identity a category of non-discrimination in international law. And, and, and that's the fight. Um, we oppose that um, because it would put uh, sexual orientation and gender identity on par with religious freedom. And, you guys know what happens when that happens. <laughs> Religious freedom almost always loses. Uh, uh, so her, I'm told by people who know that that's her passion. And I, I don't know, you know, Penny says that she's pro-life, but I'm not sure if Penny really knows. So we shall see. Uh, but yeah, that's that Heather and Howard's passion is not necessarily ours. Well, I mean, like you said before about the other person, even if she is pro-life, if the other issue is her prime thing, she's not going to waste political capital. Well, yeah, and, and let me just say, and I, 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 I put this up, there's a difference between people who are pro-life and who do pro-life. You know what I mean? And, and at, when you do pro-life, that is to say, when you've got skin in the game, it's a different situation than I am, I'm pro-life. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll put up a, bump, a bumper sticker or whatever. So, so, so we shall see. We shall see. Yes? Um, some of us have had a good deal of connections in Africa, particularly yes. East Africa. <clears throat> Outside of the UN proper, I know that there's tremendous influence of UN organizations and other international NGOs mm -hmm. uh, trying to, as you say, you know, influence that intellectual imperialism and cultural imperialism. Yes. If you were talking to, for example, African bishop colleagues, if you were trying to educate the, uh, them about what's happening and how things are being manipulative. Um, how their people are being impacted by these organizations, what would you say by way of warning or counseling? Well, you know, the, the remarkable thing is I, I would bet that that African bishop knows it already and knows it better than we do. Uh, because faithful people in Africa, are, I think, are very aware that, that, there's, that, that, that there's an effort to impose a particular ideological agenda on them. Um, you know, I, I, in my yeah. experience, you, you're giving too much credit. Is that yeah. right? Oh, the, absolutely. The language manipulation has been very successful. Yes. That, you know, the, I was in a meeting where there was talk about a conference that people were going to offer, and it was going to be self-sponsoring, i.e., the, the, the locals didn't have to pay for it, the international organizations were oh. going to pay for it. It was right. all about maternal health. And after the meeting, I went digging, and it turns out it was the Internet Planned Parenthood Foundation that was doing right. it. Right. But they didn't ask those questions because it was maternal health and they didn't have to pay for it. Well, you know, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, a lot of the code words just go, I mean, you know, even at the UN, we have, you're right, we have to educate new diplomats at the United Nations because they think reproductive health is totally fine. And so we have to sit down and show them where the, where the language, it's, it's not easy. The language was started here and this is how it was advanced and this is why. Uh, and that maternal health is, is used in precisely the same way. Um, it's a difficult process for people who do not know. Yeah. Austin, thanks for all your work. Sure. Really appreciate it. The, um, one of the things that, that uh, we're finding right now is a, is a new province is that there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of uh, mission mission shaped. Well, excuse me. That there are hundreds and thousands of multinationals from across the world that are here already. That the U.S. is on its way to being a blended nation in 12, 15 years. Uh, our outreach and our work uh, as a new province among uh, multinational groups is 
growing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. In terms of education and participation in this cause, what are the what are the key issues for us and key language trainings for um, uh, Kenyans, Ethiopians, Chinese here, here in this country? Here in this no. country to help the church in that country or to help at the United Nations. Wow, that's a tough question. You know. Um, yeah, no. People often, you know, they'll ask me what what can I do, and I and uh, when I talk about the UN, and, and and I say if you want to come to the UN, you you can come. We'll show you what to do. But the main thing that you need to do is to stay home and take over the school board. Um, you know, uh, my wife uh, Bethany Cosma uh, both been working uh, on uh, the transgender <coughs> issue yeah. at the Fairfax County School Board, and I think the very best thing that you can do. Um, I mean, you know what? We're, we're beating the UN, uh, at least in terms of establishing norms. Um, uh, and if you're talking to people here, yeah. uh, I, I think the best thing that you can do is to get them, let them know, and it's hard because they probably can't afford anything else, but you've got to let them know uh, what's going on in the schools. Right. You've got to let them know um, what they're teaching five-year-olds. You know, they're in the Fairfax County School System, they are now teaching children as young as five that, that sex is assigned at birth. Um, and and um, it, would be, it would be such a it's blessing. It's not assigned at birth. No, it is assigned. Oh, 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 in terms of whether you should be a man. No, no, you, no. Which is what you're, you're, not, you're not a boy, you were simply a son. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then you choose later what you want to be. Oh, right. They're teaching that to, yes. to, to little kids in Fairfax County School System. So I, I would say the very best thing that you can do is, I mean, put aside the UN. And if, you, if, 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 your, if, if your target group is here, yep. man, get them involved in the school board. And I'll tell you what, there, it, it's, 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 it's much more effective with, with, a, with a black person with a foreign accent talking yep. to the school board than me or my wife. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I, right. I would highly recommend that's what you do. Yeah. Um, and if somebody wants to come to you, we're fine. We, 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 we'd, we'd welcome them. Well, the, the other thing that that will, that's a very good strategy, because that, they get very passionate about it, what they're discovering here, and what they communicate back home from here of real yes. cultural experience that's supported by the church. You know, that, that we want that message to get back home to. Nairobi and Kampala. Well, yeah, and what they need, what they need to tell their friends back home is that this is what is being imported, right. and this this is what the UN is advancing. This is what U uh, the U.S. is advancing, even under the Trump administration. Uh, you know, they've still got the rainbow flag. You know, in foreign embassies around the world. Um, yeah. So so if if you can communicate that to a foreign group here, who will then tell their friends well, back home. Yeah. yeah, that that that's very 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 important. You know, uh, our friend Bethany Cosma, who's at USAID, true blue pro-life pro family, young lady, three, three or four kids, um, you know, she made a speech at the, with my wife at the Fairfax County School Board. It was quite remarkable what these ladies did because um, uh, they were ramming through this new family life education thing, which is pure pornography. And uh, they, and, and they did it without really advising the parents. And so my wife and some of her friends got together and for a solid year, every two weeks at the school board meeting when there was a, you know, the, there's an open mic and the, you stand in line and, and you get on the list, every single speaker for a solid year was against FLE. It was, it was quite remarkable. It didn't, it didn't make any difference whatsoever. Um, but, but you know, and some, and you know, there were Muslims who came out and, and you know, with the everything and, and, and spoke. It, it was really, it was really quite amazing. But the bottom line is, is the local school board does exactly what it wants to do. So, you know, it's like you got to get these people involved politically and at the school board and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, at the UN on the on, on a lot of these issues, we just have so many good friends who are willing to step up and, 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 and help us, especially on the family issue. You know, we, we live in a third world country when it comes to the family. You know, and they live in the first world when it comes to the family. Yes, ma'am. So do you have any influence of really defining some of these conventions that have been passed in, in European countries? Because what I have found was that um, they are uh, actually 
counting the praises of it within the religious communities because they don't understand the ramifications that it's going to have on the broader culture of their country. And I have seen that firsthand um, at missionary conferences. In Europe. In Europe. Yeah. And you mean talking, talking up UN t uh, treaties so, and things like that? Especially the one on the child. Yeah. And they are educating the missionaries on how that plays out in their ministries and what, yeah. how great it was. And in one of these, they actually said in a derogatory note how the only countries that haven't passed it was Somalia in the United States. Yeah, that's right. Which I took issue with later, and it did get some response. But... Um, is there any way that your group or would have some kind of connections that could truly educate them what it really is saying, what it really means? Part, part of our mission, b besides affecting the debate at the United Nations, is telling the larger world what's really going on there. And so we have published extensively on all this. We, ha we have a, a weekly report called the Friday Facts, which goes to 300,000 people in four languages. And so it literally goes into, you know, I, I've gotten emails from American soldiers in huts in Afghanistan who get the Friday facts and making a donation. Uh, it's quite astounding. So, so it, a big part of our job is getting the word out uh, precisely on these particular questions. Now, the U.S. is the only country in the world that hasn't, rec you know, ratified the Convention of the Rights in of the Somalia? Child or or CEDA or well, the funny thing about Somalis, they don't even have a government. So it's it's, 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 it's pretty derogatory <laughs> to the labels, isn't it? Um, but you know we, we haven't ratified any of those. Even when there's been a Democrat Senate, we you know, and, and we have gone before the Senate uh, and testified against the, the the convention on persons with disabilities. I mean, how can you be against that? Well, easy, you know, because it's full of bad stuff, you know. And the Convention on the Rights of the Child gives children religious freedom separate from their parents. It gives them the right to information from any source. Hello, pornography. Um, you know, th these are these are these are wicked documents, and people. Somehow, the Christian community it is in the churches that's right. over there. That's right. That's right. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's I know they think they think we're nuts. They think we're nuts. Oh, why? Well, because the, you know, among a lot of people, they think that the UN is hunky dory and that these treaties are really important. I mean, yeah, I've got I've, I've, I was in a convention on the rights of the child debate recently on social media. Like, how could you be against it? I mean, even among good people. So yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I back you up on that. Yes. Kind of a follow-up on that, and then something you said early in your talk. The United States, <coughs> by the grace of God, happens to have a governmental system that is extremely resistant, frankly, to sign the international treaties. Yeah. So we we just, as a matter of course, it's amazing. are like bad boys and just like, Nah, we're not signing it. Yeah. Yeah, the president signed Yeah, but we're not going to. The Senate is not going to ratify it. Mm -hmm. We don't ratify anything. Good, bad, and different. We, we tend not to ratify these treaties. Yeah. Sometimes we say we'll go along with it, but it's not the law of the land in the United States, and we can always opt out anytime we want because we never ratify it. Great. The flip side is you mentioned that, that sort of very loosey goosey principle of generally recognized international law. Yeah. Who wins today, and where do you see that legal environment going? Well, you, let me give you a couple of examples that are underscore what you just said, and that is that when the when the Supreme Court uh, overturned the juvenile death penalty, and and, and that's the, the death penalty on on because of acts committed as as a juvenile, not that they're putting sixteen year olds to death, but um, anyway, so they overturned the juvenile death penalty. The Supreme Court cited the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Yes, they did. You know a lot. <laughs> well, because of that, I know. They, 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 that they cited convention. the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which we have never ratified. Uh, they cited uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which we have ratified. It's one of the implementing documents of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But they cited the part of it that we specifically rejected when we ratified it on the death penalty. So the, so the Supreme Court, this is now some years ago, you know, uh, who, who was it that just retired? 
Ken Kennedy went along with all this stuff, and he spent his summers going all to these to these left wing legal summer camps in Europe, and and and, and it was imbued with this this idea that we need to accept these new international standards. Uh, I, I'm confident right now that the existing court won't do that. Uh, I think the minority certainly will, um, but. Uh, but yeah, it's out there in the air. I mean, I'm not even a little worried about the, 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 the what's his name, the, the Chief Justice now. Well, I'm a little worried about he's him. Now the I know, I know. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question directly. Please. No, no, you, you worry. <laughs> yeah. You don't know, but you worry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like I said in the beginning, I mean, it's a dead certainty that, uh, that you and documents are going to be cited if and when Roe is ever reheard. Dead certainty, because the you know the 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 uh, international covenant on uh, civil and political rights uh, now includes the right to abortion. The right to life means the right to abortion. You know, um, and they now say that uh, that uh, reproductive health that 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 CEDAW guarantees the right to abortion, and 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 so it's it's a dead certainty that you know if she's still kicking, um, Ginsburg et al. will 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 cite these 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 treaties. Um, you know, some years ago, um, during the Bush administration, um, when, and th this was all laid out in a court case, when the Bush administration reinstituted Mexico City policy, um, they were sued almost immediately by the Center for Reproductive Rights. Uh, and the Center for Reproductive Rights made the case that customary international law was established by the re repetitious use of the phrase reproductive health in non-binding UN resolutions, and therefore, Abortion is the law of the world. It's the law of this land, no matter what you do with Roe v. and that's the argument. Now that would they now that the case was never heard because the court determined they lacked standing, but they but they didn't comment on on the underlying question. But that's the underlying reason that this ERA amendment is coming up again for votes, including in Virginia. Yeah. And they want to pass it. Not because they're afraid that if Roe v. Wade is ever overturned, then that will supersede. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so I noticed your reviews on Amazon. You got 72 reviews right now of your book. On this? Yeah, you got 14% uh, of them are one star reviews. <laughs> mostly by people that have not clearly <laughs> not read the book. So, <laughs> they say things like, this is a bunch, this guy's not even a scientist, blah, blah, blah. And so, but they don't reference one specific thing in the book. So, yes. so hats off to you for having some, uh, so many enemies um, so, um, who, who are just against you and don't even engage the argument. So, but anyway, my real question, I just thought you might be interested in that. I have 57 references at, uh, at uh, Right Wing Watch also. You have a lot of... You have a lot of five-star reviews, though, so just so you know. So most of them are five-star. So uh, my question is, just uh, what's going on in China? Uh, what's what's status in China? I know they had that the one child thing for a long time. I, I hear they've loosened that up a little bit. You know, my my colleague Susan Yoshihara just did the John Bachelor show last night. Oh, what's that? My colleague Susan Yoshihara did the John Bachelor radio show last night. If you all don't know the John Bachelor show. He's the smartest guy on radio, yeah, isn't he? And he's so comforting to listen to, but you know what? I think he's got throat cancer. He's got a raspy thing last night, and, and, and he told Susan that he's at Sloan Kettering and things like that, so uh, pray for John Bachelor. But anyway, part of the, part of the conversation is that, is that the uh, policymakers in China are, are, are now considering that they will never be able to recover from their demographic yeah, spiral. Right. Right. Mm. No young... Uh, no same. women around to marry the men. That's right. Right. That's right. That's right. And it's a dangerous situation because you know we, we know from our own inner city experience, you know men, men. The comedian said men without men without women are like bear bears with furniture. <laughs> That's so sexist. Like you need women to civilize you. Well, yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah, George Pilgrim wrote about this. So, uh, so yeah, you know, it, it's like they're going to have a lot of bears with with uh, with furniture there in, in China, and that's also very dangerous because you know yeah. what are you going to do with all these guys? It's it's uh, it's a very serious problem. So what's going on in China is a it's a whole lot of bad news, mm -hmm. and and it, there's a saying now that China is going to get old before it gets rich. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, because they're just they're just moving along so fast down that demographic spiral. 
And in the United States, there's a new paper out that we wrote about this week, uh, out by a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, who's predicting social strife in the United States because of our declining fertility rate, which is now at 1.8 something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I tell young people, boy, I got in trouble the other day for saying this on social media, um, marry young and have a lot of kids. Oh my golly, that's, that's controversial, you know? Yeah. Marry young and have a lot of kids. Um, but boy, that's the only thing. Anywho, I, I, I have to wrap up and, and say, I've got to go pick up my daughter at 3 o'clock at Oakcrest. <laughs> so I, I, was, I thought we were going to start at 1 o'clock. Anyway, it's a... I don't know when they're coming to your seminar seconds. The what? Where's the second one? The second one's at 2.50. <laughs>